I think it's already recording. Uh, okay. Okay, so thank you very much uh, uh, for coming to this seminar. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Bruno Laizola. He's a senior fellow at CERN. Actually, Bruno made uh, his PhD at the uh, Complutense de Madrid on fast timing measurements, ultra fast timing measurements, I would say. This is actually part of the things that he will explain to us today. Um, he's working on exotic nuclei and he did a lot of this type of measurements to determine lifetimes of this nu uh, exotic nuclei with very high precision. Uh, he, after, after finishing his PhD, he moved to Guelph, I think I said correctly, in Canada, where he kept working at Triumph, uh, doing uh, gamma spectroscopy, also doing lifetime measurements, and then he moved to Triumph to continue working on that. And more recently at CERN, he is working on the, he saw the I saw the solenoidal spectrometer, which is kind of a new generation spectrometer uh, of, uh, with a silicon array detector inside a magnetic uh, MRA, uh, solenoidal magnetic field. And today he will talk about uh, applications of uh, the lifetime measurements he did and he's still doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very interesting uh, talk that he will explain today. And, Whenever you want, you can share your screen and you can start. Okay, can you see my screen and the pointer? Yeah, everything works perfectly. I'm going to mute this. Great. So, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me here to give this talk. So yes, today I'm gonna talk about some of my former projects before I start working in, in the superconducting solenoid. And I'm going to talk about the nuclear fast timing and how the main limitation for nuclear fast timing is actually the speed of light that is not the fast enough for uh, what we need. Okay. So I believe that not the, all of you uh, research in uh, nuclear structures. So I'm gonna give you a very short overview of what are uh, nuclear lifetimes and transition strengths and how they impact uh, the collective motion of nucleus and what are Weisskopf estimates. I'm gonna explain you what is the electronic fast timing method, which kind of experimental setup we need and how do we analyze the data to extract the lifetimes. And I'm going to end with some practical applications of these, um, of these methods uh, beyond the realm of uh, nuclear physics into more uh, applied fields in biology, in medical imaging, and in cancer treatment. Okay, so nuclear lifetimes and transition strengths. So you most likely have studied, uh, maybe even in high school, that the electrons in, in, in an atom, they are uh, organized in, in cells. Each one of these cells, they have different angular momentums and we can arrange them in energy. So when we have a, a large atom with many a large number of uh, electrons, they will occupy these uh, orbitals uh, as a function of the energy, as increasing energy. Okay, so the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus, they follow a very similar model. That is the so-called nuclear cell model. You have a number of uh, orbitals, also with a different uh, angular momentums, and you can arrange them by energy. So when you keep adding uh, protons and neutrons to your nucleus, they will occupy these orbitals in order. And then they are the same as in the, in the atom, the, each orbital can fit a fixed number of, uh, in this case, protons of or neutrons. Okay, so this is uh, a very simplified level scheme. So we have different levels at different energies, and we see that there is one level at the lowest. This is the so-called uh, ground state, and it is the minimum energy. And well, in this case, these are neutrons. 
when you have all your neutrons in the lowest energy orbitals and the possible lowest energies, this is what we call the ground state that is the lowest uh, energy state that a nucleus can have. And we assign to that state the uh, energy of zero that is a uh, relative uh, number and we random, semi-randomly we assign the zero. If we now promote one neutron from one orbital to a higher energy one, your nucleus will be left in an excited state. It will have a higher energy. Just the same as uh, atomic, uh, the atoms, the electrons in the atom are paired together and they have opposite spins. When they have opposite spins, their uh, angular momentums, they cancel each other out. So exactly the same in the nucleus, we have that the neutrons, they were arranged in pairs of opposite spin and their angular momentum will can cancel each other out. So what we have is that in the end, the total angular momentum of the nucleus is gonna be mainly determined by the angular or the, the angular momentum of the orbital that our last ampere um, neutron is occupied. So, for the ground state, we have that is an angular momentum of five half. And when we promote this neutron to the next orbital, which is a one half, we see that the total angular momentum is a one half. This is all very simplified, but it's just to give you some concept for what is coming after. So uh, the nucleus can transition between these uh, different states, and those are electromagnetic uh, transitions. So when we have a nucleus in an excited state, eventually it will decay to a lower energy state and it will do so by emitting a, a gamma ray, an electromagnetic transition of a, with the energy difference between the two states. So in this case, 495 uh, K. But the most important part for this topic, for this talk, is that the these excited states, they are metastable states. So the nucleus is gonna stay for some time in an excited state before decaying to, to the lower energy one. And the time it will take to, to decay is what we call the half-life. When, when we have, in this case, 286 picoseconds, that means that once that amount of time has passed, there was a 50% chance of this excited state decaying to the ground state. This follows the Poisson distribution. And when you have a very large number of uh, nucleus or excited states decaying, you can approximate this Poisson distribution to an exponential decay, as you probably have already studied. What we call the half-life is the amount of time it takes for an initial sample to decay to half of that the initial number of states or, or, or nucleus. After two uh, half-lives, we'll have a quarter of the initial number of, uh, of nucleus, so on and so forth, and that's how you get this exponential. One of the characteristic, uh, unique characteristic of the nuclear half-lives is that they span over a really large uh, order of magnitude, over 35 orders of magnitude. You have lifetimes down from femtoseconds all the way to billions of years. So they span a really range, large range of, of numbers. Okay, so what is interesting about the, these lifetimes? Well, the lifetimes itself don't tell us that much, but from the lifetimes, we can extract the transition strengths. What are the transition strengths? Well, they follow this apparently complex uh, equation but actually most of these terms are just constants. We just have some dependence with the angular momentum or the multipolarity of the uh, electromagnetic transition being emitted with the energy and with the half-life. In general, it's relatively easy to measure the angular momentum and the energy. The most difficult uh, parameter observable to extract is the lifetime. But once we have measured all those three ingredients, we can get the transition strength. What does tell us the, the transition strength? Well, the transition strength is telling us how likely is one initial state to transition into a final state. And this is related 
to the matrix element, to the element that connects those two states. So it is giving us an idea on what is the overlap into the wave function of the initial state and the wave function of the final state. So the larger is this overlap between wave functions, the more likely is this uh, transition to happen and the faster it will happen. Okay, what kind of information can we get from this? Well, as I have mentioned, this transition between nuclear states are electromagnetic in nature. And electromagnetism is something that we understand quite well. So Raisko, a very smart scientist, was able to calculate what should be the transition strength of one single neutron or proton transitioning between one orbital and another. And he came to two expressions one for ele electric transition and another one for magnetic transition. Again, this looks like a very complex equation, but most of these terms are just constant. We just have a dependence on the multipolarity, the angular momentum carried by the electric photon and with the number of neutrons or and protons, the number of nucleons in total, which are, is just a way of expressing this, the radius, the size of the nucleon. So you can calculate what will be the transition strength of one single nucleon jumping from one orbital to another, and that you can call it your single particle strength, your theoretical single particle strength. Then you compare that to the transition strength that you have measured. If your theoretical value and your measured value are the same, the ratio between the two of them is one, what we call one Weisskopf unit, you can say that the transition that you have measured corresponds to a single particle. However, we have measured a large number of transition strengths, and here, well, they are as a, as a function of the mass number. This red line is roughly what they will be one Weisskopf unit. And you can see that there are a very large number of transitions that are well above one Weisskopf unit. What does it mean? It means that to explain what is happening, what is, uh, how is the transition between those two states, you cannot explain it with one single uh, neutron jumping from one orbital to another. You need to use, because some of these values, you can see as the mass increases, as the number of nucleons, of protons and neutrons increases, you see that this, uh, the ratio between the experimental and the theori theoretical single particle, they go to several hundred uh, of Weisskopf units. So that means that you need the interaction of a lot of uh, nucleons and moving uh, simultaneously from one orbital to another. And that is what we call in nuclear physics as uh, collective motions. And it is strongly correlated to the deformation of the nucleus. So usually when we represent the nucleus, we represent them as spherical. But actually, it's very common for nucleus to, to have deformed shapes. The most common shapes are oblate and prolate deformation, that are the so-called quadruple deformations. If you are more into sports, and oblate and prolate doesn't tell you anything. You can see that the spherical is just a football ball, and oblate will be a frisbee, and prolate will be a rugby ball. And once you have an ax, axis of asymmetry, you don't have a spherical uh, nucleus, then you can have a rotation and vibration along those asymmetry axes. These uh, collective motions will imply the movement of several uh, nucleons simultaneously. Here, this is what we call the nuclear chart. And here we have all the isotopes that we have discovered so far. And they are represented as a, as a function on the number of neutrons and the number of protons. The gray squares are those nucleus that we have measured to be spherical. And those with uh, colors are those that they have the formation, either oblate or prolate. And as you can see, most of the nucleus, well more than half of them, have significant deformation. So we can see that by measuring uh, transition strengths, we can get an idea on what is the collectivity of the nucleus, and that in turn will tell us how deformed, how many nucleons do we need in the transition, and how deformed a nucleus will be. 
And since this is a really common feature of the nucleus, we can see that this is very important where we are trying to understand the structure of nuclei. Okay, so how do we actually measure these, uh, these lifetimes to describe the transition strengths? Well, as I mentioned before, these uh, half-lives, they span well over 35 orders of magnitude. So depending on the time range that you want to measure, you can use very different techniques. Here, there are some of the most common ones. Of all these techniques, the only one that actually measures directly the lifetime is the electronic time. All the other ones, they uh, imply indirect methods in the like properties to extract the lifetime. The only one that is actually measuring time is the electronic time. In this technique, you can measure all the way down to 10 picoseconds. And in theory, there is no upper limit. You can measure any amount of time. That's obviously not true. That is a gross oversimplification. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on how to measure lifetimes that are on the picosecond range. So first of all, what is a picosecond? So a picosecond is 10 to the minus 12 seconds. It's really short. It is so short that the, a photon, that we know is the fastest particle in the universe, it will take over three picoseconds to travel one millimeter in vacuum. So if you are trying to uh, measure lifetimes that are in the order of picoseconds, any millimeter deviation in your setup is going to induce uh, perturbation in your measurement that is of the same order of magnitude of what you want to measure. So this is the first uh, point that the links to the title of the talk that we cannot consider the speed of light instantaneous when you are measuring such a short time because any tiny uh, deviation in your distance is going to induce a very significant time difference of the same order of what you are trying to measure. Okay, how do we actually measure uh, these lifetimes? Well, let's say that I want to measure the lifetime of this intermediate state. The first thing I need to do is to populate states above it. In this example, I'm using beta minus decay. That is not the only method, but it's probably the most common. So you have a mother uh, nucleus that is beta minus decay into an excited state. This state emits a photon to populate the target state. This is the one I want to measure. And after some time, it will decay, emitting another photon. So I need a system with us at least two detectors. I will use one of the detectors to detect the feeding uh, gamma, and that will start a clock. Then I will, after some period of time, our, uh, our second detector is going to detect the second decaying photon. And that is going to be the stop of our uh, clock. So from this time difference between the feeding and decaying photons, we can extract the lifetime of this intermediate state. Of course, the electronics behind all these are way more complex. I don't have time to go into all the details, but for example, decided Deciding when a signal arrives to your detector is not trivial. And for that, we use something called cost and fraction discriminators that I'm not going to explain in detail. The clock that we actually use is something that we call a time to amplitude converter attack. These tags, they are analog electronic modules. And it's important to say that they are analog because up to, the, to today, the analog electronics are much faster than the digital ones. So you cannot make these measurements yet. Will they will be able, but yet you cannot make these measurements with digital electronics. So this analog module, it has two inputs. One will be the start. And when it receives the signal, our tag module starts raising a voltage. When it receives a second signal in the stop, it will stop increasing the voltage and the output will be a signal, an analog signal, which amplitude is proportional to the time difference between your start and stop, hence the name time to amplitude converter. OK, that is regarding the electronics. But the most important part of our setup is actually the detector that is going to be measuring the gamma rays. 
Maybe you have heard of the high purity germaniums. Those are the most famous uh, gamma, gamma radiation detectors. And they are really good at measuring the energy of these uh, gammas with very high precision. And that is something very important. But those are semiconductor uh, detectors and they are very slow. If you want to measure something very short, short, very short times, you need something much faster. And for that, we usually use uh, scintillators, inorganic scintillators. Of the current uh, scintillators, probably the best ones are the lanthanum bromides, which are crystals that when the a photon, a high energy photon, interacts with the molecules of the crystal, these molecules are excited. And when they de excite, they emit UV, ultraviolet UV photons. These photons are uh, recorded by a photocode and by photoelectric uh, event. These uh, UV photons are transformed into an electron. Then these electrons, uh, they go through several steps in which uh, of the dynodes, and in each dynode, um, the number of electrons is multiplied. And this way, we just increase the amplitude of our, of our signal to increase our uh, signal to noise ratio. But the main problem is that the, when the molecule of the scintillator, the lanthanum bromide, is excited, it will emit the UV photons isotropically in all directions. And what is the problem with that? That some of the photons, they have to reach the photodetector. Some of the photons will have a rather direct uh, path and they will reach here quickly. But some others will have to bounce around many more times before arriving the photocathode. These crystals usually have a couple, three centimeters long and wide. So it actually takes the UV photons quite a long time to arrive. If the speed of light was instantaneous, was infinite, all the photons will be arriving at the same time. And our time resolution will be a delta at zero. However, since each one of these photons is going to take a slightly different time, what we see is that our timing resolution follows a Gaussian. The time it takes for these photons to arrive follows this Gaussian. And the width of this Gaussian is what we call the timing resolution of our detectors, which is the main limitation that we have. The finite speed of light and the time it takes for the photos to bounce into the photo detector. So you can see that the, the main um, limitation, one of the main limitations in this technique is actually the size of the crystals and the time it takes for the light to travel inside these crystals. Okay, so how do we actually extract the lifetimes? Well, if the lifetime we are trying to measure is long and by long it means the same order of our time in resolution or even a bit uh, longer, if we do the time difference between the feeding gamma and the decaying gamma, this time difference is gonna show exponential decay. And this, here, this is in logarithmic scale. So this exponential decay, we see it as a straight line. So we just feed this straight line. And from the slope, we can extract the lifetime of that the intermediate level that we are interested in. If the lifetime that we want to measure is much shorter, we see that the that lifetime is still will show if we had infinite um, time in resolution will show as a um, as exponential decay. But since we have some time in resolution in the shape of a Gaussian, that exponential decay is going to be hidden inside this Gaussian, and we are not going to see it. So what we do is we follow a different thing. We first have a reference transition is the red one here it, you know, for which we know very well the lifetime let's say that is below one picosecond really fast we can call it zero so we we plot it now we do again the time difference between two gammas of the level that we want to measure and we see that this time distribution the centroid is shifted from that of the our reference uh, lifetime so we see that the difference between these two centroids 
is going to be the lifetime of the life of, uh, of the state that we want to measure. And this is an actual example of an actual ex experimental data in which we measure a lifetime of uh, 44 picoseconds. We have measured even shorter lifetime, but uh, this is just uh, one. Okay, so maybe I have convinced you that we can measure a uh, time difference down to a few picoseconds, but you may say, well, I don't care about the nuclear structure, so what is in it for me? Well, some very smart people have found that they, with this method, it can be applied to some other fields, such as biology or, or medicine. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. So the first one is one that is mainly applied in biology and it's called the perturbed angular correlation. First, I need to introduce another concept and it's uh, of the multiple uh, radiation that maybe you have seen in your uh, electromagnetism courses. When you have a monopole, a spherical distribution of charge, and it emits radiation, it is going to emit it isotropically. So all directions have the same likelihood. The, radi the electromagnetic radiation is going to be emitted in all uh, directions equally. But if you have a deformation, a charge distribution, for example, a quadruple deformation, which is, as I showed you before, is very common in nucleus. Now, this radiation is not going to be emitted isotropically. And there are some directions that are more likely to be emitted than others. And we have even higher order deformation, but we are going to focus on this one. So now the radiation is being emitted uh, following what we call a angular distribution, which some angles are more likely than others. However, in general, when you're running an experiment, you do it with a very large number of nucleus. And each one of those nucleus is going to be pointing in a different direction. So even if the individual uh, gamma emission of each individual nucleus will follow a certain angular distribution, the overall of all the nucleus pointing each one in a different direction is going to look isotropical, just because your nucleus are not organized. They are all randomly distributed. So what we can do is we can play another trick in which uh, we need at least a cascade with two consecutive gamma. So we will detect the first gamma and we will try to infer what is the most likely uh, orientation of our nucleus from the direction of the first gamma. And then we will measure the angle at which a second gamma has been emitted. And that is what is called gamma-gamma angular correlation because we measure mm -hmm. the angle between gammas. We use the first one as a reference and we and the second one that we measure is what we use for, for the angle. So here, this is an example. This red line is not necessarily the shape of the nucleus. It will correspond to our angular distribution. And we see that the farther it is from the center, more likely it is to be emitted, and the closer it is to the center, less likely. So if we put two detectors at 180 degrees, and we are measuring a gamma cascade in this example like this one, we see that at 180 degrees, we are going to measure a large number of coincidences. However, if we place our detectors at 90 degrees, the likelihood of two gammas being emitted one after the other at 90 degrees is much smaller. So we are going to measure a much lower number of coincidences. Now, this is only true if the time the, between the first gamma and the second gamma is very short. If we have a long lifetime, as in this case, this 85 nanoseconds, that is enough time for the nucleus to actually move, okay? And we are using the first gamma as a reference, assuming that the nucleus will not move. But if we are giving it enough time to move, that angular correlation is not going to be valid anymore. So here is the thing. What can make a nucleus move? Well, as I have mentioned several times, most of the nucleus, they have a quadruple deformation. They have a charge distribution. So if we put a charge distribution in an electric field, this is going to induce the nucleus to proceed, to, proceed to, to rotate. So now, as a function of time, our angular distribution is going to be changing. And we are going to have that the, what we were calling 180 degrees, 
uh, sometimes it's gonna be 90. So we are gonna have an angular distribution that is gonna be oscillating in between the pure 180 degrees and the pure 90 degrees. In this technique, what we want to measure is not the lifetime of the nucleus, which we know quite well. What we want to measure is the frequency of this, uh, of this rotation. And that rotation it usually happens quite fast, is in the order of a few picoseconds. So we need very fast detectors. Again, the fastest detectors are these inorganic scintillators that I mentioned before, and lambs and bromide is probably the, the best one of them. Okay, so on what will depend this uh, frequency? Well, it will depend on two things. One, it will depend on the quadrupole moment of your nucleus on this deformation, and that is something that we can measure with other methods, and it will also depend on the electric field that it is experimenting. What can create an, an electric field that affects a nucleus? Well, if you implant your nucleus in a large molecule, or also in a crystal, but I'm gonna focus on molecules, all the electrons of the molecule around the nucleus are gonna create an electric field. So here, you have that we have implanted uh, an isotope of uh, mercury that emits a gamma cascade as the one that I showed before. We have implanted it in different uh, biological molecules. Each one of these molecules is gonna induce a different electric field. And one big difference between this example and previous is here, it is oversimplified to let's say 1D. Here, these are complex molecules, so they are gonna induce electric fields that uh, are in 3D. So they are gonna induce not one single oscillation, but it's gonna be there are gonna be several modes of uh, oscillation. And you can see that depending in which molecule we implanted, is gonna induce different signals. These are the actual things that they, we measure with the feed that we perform to the data. And here you have the um, Fourier transform. So these peaks that you see here are the frequency of uh, those different uh, rotation modes that the nucleus is, is experimented. So with this method, we can uh, find if we implant uh, a nucleus, we, we can find out to which molecule it is implanted and we can even uh, find out in which position of the molecule it has implanted because the signal is gonna be different. It is implanted here and here and here. For that, the, well, the chemists, they are very smart people and they have models that they can simulate their molecules very well and find out what are the electric fields with very high precision. Okay, so how is any of this useful? Well, one of the main treatments for cancer are the radiopharmaceuticals. So and the chemists have created the large biomolecules called chelators that uh, are very specific molecules that can attach to tumor cells. They will not attach to healthy tissue, but only focus specifically on tumor cells. So the trick is that you insert a radionuclide into your chelator, chelator and the chelator is gonna travel through the human body and it's gonna attach to the tumor cell. The ideal radionuclear that you use is a metallic um, alpha emitter. Why alpha emitters? Well, alphas, they have very high destructive power. They are gonna break the DNA of the tumor cell and it's gonna prevent them from uh, replicating. But even better, they have a very short range. So the typical alpha particle can only penetrate about 10 cells. And that is very important because um, surrounding the tumor, you are gonna have healthy tissue. So you just want to destroy the tumor, preserving as much healthy tissue as possible. If you were to use the uh, beta emitters, a beta particle can also destroy the uh, DNA, but it will penetrate several much larger, uh, much larger number of cells. So it's gonna damage a lot more healthy tissue about the tumor. But this also brings us to the other issue with this technique. And that is that the, when the chelator is traveling through the human body, it's gonna be seen experimenting very different environments. 
in different parts of the human body. And there are different pH levels, there is different temperatures, and the ability of the chelator to bound to bind to the radionuclei depends on those parameters of temperature and pH. So we have to be sure that the molecule, biomolecule, the chelator, and the radionuclide are gonna remain attached to each other until they reach the, the tumor. Otherwise, uh, if the chelator drops the radionuclide before arriving the tumor, you're gonna have this radionuclide destroying healthy tissue. That is something obviously very bad for the patient. So since obviously testing all these things in humans is forbidden, we have to be sure, we have to run all these experiments in the lab to be sure that they work before trying them in humans. So what we do is, uh, while well, we have a chemist and they come out with a chelator and they say, okay, I believe this works. And we implant one of the radionuclides. And then we perform these um, perturbed angular correlations that I have just explained um, by submerging this uh, chelator with the radionuclide in solutions with different pH. We see that for a neutral pH, the signal of the radionuclide being attached to the chelator is very strong. But as we increase the pH, it becomes a more basic environment, we see that the signal is weaker and weaker and weaker. And here is almost gone. So that means that here, a very large percentage of the radionuclides are still attached, while here, almost all of them have been uh, detached. This example is just a function of uh, pH, but this can also be done as a function of temperature. So the trick is that you simulate different parts of the human body, and you find out if your chelator and your radionuclide will uh, remain attached through the whole uh, journey in the human body. And in this case, it will not survive, so this biomolecule was not good. And we had to go back to the lab and create a different one. Okay, that was uh, one example. Another example of uh, nuclear timing applied to medical imaging will be the PET time of flight. So PET, it stands for positron, uh, positron electron tomography, and you probably know, but the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. So when a positron and an electron interact, they are annihilate and they emit to 511 kb uh, photons, which corresponds to the mass of the positron and the electron. The most important part here is that by momentum conservation, these two photons are gonna be emitted exactly in opposite direction, so exactly at 180 degrees. So what is the trick here? And the trick is that we create a positron emitter as a fluorine 18. And we can do it with a nuclear reaction with oxygen. So we create this fluor fluorine 18. We attach it to a glucose molecule, to sugar, and we inject the sugar into the patient. Now, tumoral cells, they are way more active than normal cells, so they will consume a lot more sugar. So it is way more likely for the glucose to be in the tumor than it to be in the healthy tissue. So you are injecting this radioactive glucose, sugar in the patient, and you assume, rightfully, that most of the sugar is gonna go to the tumoral cell. Then you put a ring of detectors around the patient, and you wait for coincidence between these two 511 uh, gamma rays. Once you detect two of them, you trace a line between them, and you know that the tumor is somewhere in between. Of course, you have to digitize all this information and run very powerful uh, calculations, but in the end, you arrive to a um, to an image or of where most of this uh, radioactive um, sugar has been consumed. And that is the most likely spot for a tumor. As I just mentioned, the one coincidence just gives you a line where this uh, tumor will be. You need a lot of different lines crossing in the same point to say that the, to get a 3D 
a point in three dimensions on where that um, on where that tumor could be. But the problem, or well, or one way to prove this, is just uh, instead of, uh, of just instead of just measuring the two gammas and just getting a line where this tumor could be, is to measure the time difference of the flying of these two photons. If you have the time difference and one of the two photons have arrived earlier than the other, then you have one point in your line where this uh, tumor is most likely to be. So you are greatly increasing your precision. This usually is a difference of uh, centimeters. So once again, you need a, a timing resolution of picoseconds to achieve the required um, increase in, in resolution. So these are some actual examples. Here you have two examples in which they just perform PET. And here is PET with this time difference, this time of flight. And you can see that there is a much greater improved uh, resolution. This is a lab uh, test, but this is an actual patient in which, uh, well, I'm no medical expert, but my colleagues told me that here you cannot see a bright spot without the time of flight. But if you incorporate these time of flight techniques, you actually see here some uh, slightly bright spot that that was an early diagnosis of a small tumor that was developing in this uh, patient. So thanks to this technique, we are able to, to identify the tumors much earlier and with a much better uh, spatial resolution. So this is great. Okay, and the last example I want to give you of the nuclear timing is once again related to cancer. I see that this is a recurring uh, topic here and it's in proton therapy, range verification. So first I need to remain, remind you of the uh, BRAF curve. So I'm gonna begin with X-rays so electromagnetic waves so you have a beam of x-rays and here is where your patient starts. This is a penetration depth uh, zero. And you see that very quickly, the x-rays start um, uh, depositing a lot of uh, energy, much before arriving towards the tumoral uh, region. And even worse, that they still keep depositing more energy way past uh, if instead of uh, electromagnetic radiation, we use uh, charged particles such as protons, we can see that our proton beam come here and once it enters the patients, distant depth zero, and they start depositing a rather a small and constant amount of energy until they arrive to a certain point and that they exponentially increase the amount of energy that they are depositing, and they deposit almost all the energy in this very narrow peak, that is what we call the black peak, and almost all the protons are stopped after the black peak. So there is almost no energy deposition after the black peak. So, well, this is a simulation. Here we have a patient, this will be their brain, and this is the tumor. So if we use X-rays, we see and that we are depositing a lot of radiation in healthy tissue, then we are burning the tumor, and still after the tumor, we are still depositing even more uh, radiation. Instead of X-rays, we are using protons or any charged particle. We see that we are giving a rather low dose before the tumor. We are depositing all the, or most of the energy in the tumor and burning it, and almost no energy after the tumor. So this patient is uh, receiving a much lower dose and is affecting their health. Uh, the impact on their health is much lower than uh, with x-rays. Okay, but uh, this technique, this proton therapy relies on, well, I have to remind you that the position of this uh, black pit, the penetration depth, strongly or only depends on the initial energy of the beam, proton beam, which is not so easy to measure. So to more accurately uh, measure this energy or 
more specifically the penetration depth of the protons and to do it live while the proton while the patient is being treated when we came up with this project the the main point of the project is that we insert a metal foil we decided that molybdenum was the best um, metal that we could use you insert a very thin um, metal foil right in front of the tube of the tumor now when the protons interact with the metal foil there will be some nuclear reactions and those nuclear reactions will emit a very specific uh, gamma rays so if you put some uh, gamma ray detectors around the patients and you are able to measure those uh, gamma rays you will know when you are hitting the metal foil that is right in front of the tumor so in a bit more detail uh, you have your protons and uh, the the energy of your protons the black peak is before your your metallic foil so in this case you are only gonna see the background because when the protons interact with the tissue with the human tissue they, they will emit uh, some gamma rays but not those distinct peaks so you are only going to see the background you are not going to see any peak so you say okay this is too low energy i need to increase the energy of the proton beam. now you increase it and now your uh, black peak of the protons is right in the in the metallic foil so now and you are inducing uh, nuclear reactions that they um, these nuclear reactions they emit these very distinctive uh, gamma rays these peaks in this very specific uh, ratio the heights of these two peaks is a very well uh, measured one so now you know that the protons are exactly reaching your metallic foil if you increase a little bit further the energy of your protons and now the black peak is beyond is behind your metallic foil now the protons will also interact with the metallic foil but they will do so at a much lower energy so now you still will have a nuclear reactions but the rate of those nuclear reactions are going to be different and the heights of these two peaks the relative height is going to be different so now you know that you are behind this uh, metallic foil so this uh, well this is still at a test um, stage we are testing this in the laboratory but the main issue we have encountered so far is that the interaction of the protons with the tissue as i just mentioned it creates a huge gamma ray background that is so uh, huge that it induces uh, very large rates on our detectors well over 50,000 gammas per second so not many detectors can detect at that speed. You need really fast uh, detectors able to take so many signals and being able to separate uh, those signals. So once again, the only detectors that are fast enough are the inorganic uh, scintillators, such as the lanthanum bromide that I have been talking about uh, all along, are the only ones that are able to separate those signals uh, fast enough. So here you can see our experiment. This is uh, the proton beam, the proton gun that was shooting the protons. These are the lanthanum bromides, the radiation detectors. And this is a piece of plastic that the, well, my medical colleagues told me that it has been designed to replicate the chemical composition of the whole human body. So once again, you don't touch this in humans. You test it in, in this piece of plastic that is very similar to, to humans or human tissue. So we insert the molybdenum and metallic foil inside the plastic and following this technique by varying the, the energy of the proton beam, we were able to find the exact position of the, of the molybdenum field and foil with a two millimeter uh, precision. And more importantly, we can do this live. So once this get to the clinical stage, we will be able to monitor what is the depth of the protons as the patient is uh, being treated. We will know on the spot if you are hitting the tumor or, or not. 
which is also great to improve the precision and to mini, minimize the amount of radiation that the, the, the patient has to, has to receive. Well, this was all I wanted to talk today. I hope I have convinced you that the measuring lifetimes is uh, one of the most uh, powerful proofs to study the structure of nuclei and that using the right technique and scintillators, we can measure lifetimes down to a few picoseconds. If a nuclear structure is not your thing, I hope I have convinced you that these uh, techniques and methods that have been developed for nuclear physics, they have practical applications in diverse fields as in, in biology or medicine or cancer treatment. So I want to end by thanking all my collaborators and I will take any questions from you. Okay, thank you very, very much, Bruno, for this very, very interesting talk. I think that it's always nice to see that there's such an interesting application for beyond fundamental science, let's say like that. So I think that right now it's a good moment for a round of questions. I don't know if there's, I, I myself have a couple of questions, so I don't know if anyone here in the audience or participants in the Zoom meeting has any question. Cannot raise hand. Ah, that's okay, Manuel. Yeah. Uh, hi, Bruno. How are you doing? Hello. Uh, so I just, just uh, <clears throat> sorry for my voice. It's a little bit cranked. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, for you to, to comment a little bit because you made this list of techniques of measuring uh, time. So you have this different uh, range of time that you can measure. And of course, you, 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 you focused on, on the electronics because this, uh, as you said, is a direct measurement, the electronic timing. But I see that you have other means to go lower than that. For example, can you comment on Kulex? How can you go lower to zero? <laughs> well, um, well, first of all, it's not true that you can go to zero. That's an approximation. But I'm not an expert. But what I know about the Kulex, Kulex stands for a Coulomb excitation. So what you do, instead of uh, populating an state, and seeing how long it takes to decay. So instead of actually measuring the, um, the lifetime, and from the lifetime later extracting, extracting the transition strength, in the Kulex, you are doing it the other way around. So you are using Coulomb excitation, which in general is either you are shooting electrons to the nucleus or the other way around, you are shooting nucleus towards a metal with a lot of, um, of electrons and that the electromagnetic interaction, that Coulomb, Coulomb interaction will excite the, the nucleus from a ground state to an excited state. And from, well, from the ratio that that is happening, you can directly extract the transition strength. Now, once you know the transition strength and you know the energy excitation, you play the opposite game that I usually play. And from the transition strength, you can extract the, the lifetime. So in theory, there is no limit to the transition strength that you can measure with Coolex. So if you can measure any Coolex uh, uh, excitation, any transition strength, you can extract any lifetime. Mm -hmm. Of course, this has plenty of uh, practical uh, problems, but well, the theory is there. Uh, see, so, so you're not actually measuring difference of times. You, you can only apply it to a lifetime, a decay. Because, so the yeah, because for example, with the electronic timing, you can measure any difference between two things, two events that happen, the time yeah. difference. But the Coolix is only applied to the decay of a, of a, nucle of a nucleus through the transition strength then. Yes. Okay, so it's not at all, uh, uh, not an indirect measurement of time. It's just uh, you extract the time from another observable, which is completely uh, different. Yes. Ah, okay, I see. Okay, so that, that, now I understand the zero. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I think there's uh, another raised hand by Wolfie. Yes, I have... Uh... 
question with respect to this slide. <clears throat> uh, to take a comparison, if you make a, uh, measure energy of a charged particle, you, you put a dipole and you measure finally not the energy, but the position. And my question is, if there's any a Doppler, Doppler effect is something like this, because you don't measure the time, you, you measure a frequency shift. And so my question is like, uh, is there any other ideas to convert time in some other effects? Uh, I was thinking as just as an example, for example, if uh, you mentioned X rays and for example, X rays and relative uh, emission of X rays may be time dependent of uh, uh, emission process. So measuring uh, the ratio of uh, X rays could be an uh, indication okay. of Um, I think someone has the microphone open. Yeah, there was an open microphone. I don't know if the, you did you understand the question anyway. I don't know if that was. And I couldn't hear the end. Okay, maybe can, can you can you repeat it very quickly, Wolfie, please? Okay, so just uh, a vague question: Is there any idea to go to the? for example, 10 to the minus 15 seconds with indirect methods, not directly time measurements, but uh, some indirect indication how fast was the process. Uh, which... And this example I was thinking, for example, in atomic X-ray emission, the characteristics of relative X-rays may depend very strongly on uh, uh, time and these are very fast processes. I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so you want to measure the time it takes for an X-ray to be emitted, or uh, not? Not directly. This would be a, my my question is vague. I, I admit. Uh, I, my my example was. Uh, Taking a spectrometer, you you don't measure the energy of a particle by a spectrometer, magnetic spectrometer. You measure a position. So, one question is: uh, Is there some idea how to convert the time you want to measure in uh, uh, in uh, uh, another effect that may be a precise indicator of time. But, but that, sorry for intervening, but I, I think that's what the Doppler and line shape methods are, no? You are measuring yes, something. Yes, this is, this is, I said, this is one, one thing where the time is converted in frequency shift. Yes, exactly. Um, that's, that's the principle of the Doppler shift, yes. Yeah. And are there other ideas? I'm not the expert on those other methods, so I'm not aware. <laughs> Jesus. <sighs> okay, so... I have a couple of questions if no one else has. Ah, you have, yeah, sure. I would have one on, on this electronic timing method, which I think you didn't comment on. Um, basically, if you, if you go to the, to, to the sketch that you had just a few, few slides onwards um, about, about this, yeah, here. Um, isn't this, this um, method very much very much dependent on on you know the the connection between the experiment and the clock like you, you you do you do sort of two measurements and the connection between them 
the between the two measurements and the uh, and the clock uh, basically define your timing um if you get this wrong you're you're in trouble right so um, i I didn't go into all the details. Exactly, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Uh, okay, so the main point here is that we don't measure absolute times. We are always measuring relative times. So all these effects that you are right to point out, that, I mean, just the length of the cables that you are using between your detector and whatever you use as a clock, all that is gonna have an effect. But you're assuming that within your precision, all those effects are going to be constant. So when you are measuring, instead of absolute times, you are measuring relative times, so time difference, all those effects are going to cancel each other out. Uh, so you so you do basically calibration measurements, and then uh, and then based, and since you know your setup, then you can you can subtract everything. Yes, exactly. You are always so yes. All the all this, the length of the cable, the time it takes the electronic to work, all that is gonna induce an offset, a delay in your measurement. But it's gonna be a rather constant offset. So then you are just subtracting two times. You have T1 plus offset and T2 plus offset. So you do T1 minus T2, and the offsets they cancel each other out, and they basically go to zero. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was, I was just meaning you have a different offset for T1 and a different offset for T2. But if you do a, but if you do a calibration measurement of, like, if you do this on a time series, for example, you, 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 you can calculate this. That's right. I think we have second question by Manuel. If that's true. Yeah, actually, it's not a question. It's uh, following the, the, the question of, of Bolfi. Uh, Bolfi, I don't know if you remember this, um, this uh, measurement that Maurice Morjon did uh, with fission and, and in, inside a crystal, where they went, they tried to go very, very short in time, uh, measuring the products of the fission and looking at if they cross or not through the holes that you have in a crystal. I mean, through the tunnels you have in a crystal. The point is that I, I don't know if they if anybody did anything else with that uh, with that technique, but one can imagine that you can do something like that. I mean, because the the the, the possibility of measuring something through the crystal will depend on this on the small movements you have inside. So in principle, they they try to go very 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 low in 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 time, but to me to my understanding, this was the only experiment where they use this. Uh, this technique to go lower in time. So maybe we can think about something like that. Yes, I said you are fully right. Yes, this is a good example of uh, something. But you know, because they, they, they had this result that nobody believed, I think nobody dared to do it again. Not, 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 not only in fission, yeah, but this, in any this, other thing. This is something I never understood, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the result was strange. But I didn't uh, see an error in, in the argumentation. Exactly. It was not, 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 not strange. It was different from what was supposed to be. Yeah. But nobody did it uh, in any so other I way. So. Call it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that, that was just, just a comment. Yes, of course, yes. You can, yes. You can use channeling effects. Right? This is this distance of uh, atomic uh, dimension that you, you get a measurement. And uh, X rays and so on may be channeled in the crystal. Yeah, so you yeah for that. example. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, that was a good point. I remember that too, <laughs> either way. So, if there's no more questions, I have just a very, very brief couple of questions because I'm kind of like puzzled about first of all how do you implant in in a molecule by the way I mean how do you do that um those were the chemists of the collaboration maybe implanting was not the right word you don't really implant you put everything together in a dissolution in a solution okay. and and they form a chemical bonds Okay, okay. Yeah, because it's not that you put it in front of a beam, right? And you... No, no. 
Okay, okay, that, that explains that. And the last question is that, what's the actual contribution from the crystal intrinsic time resolution in these measurements actually? I mean, I, I imagine that the electronic chain has some uh, contribution to the time resolution too. And if that's the case, is there any effort to look for other scintillators that are faster than antembromide? I, I, I can imagine something like, now there's nowadays there's a lot of uh, research on liquid scintillators for dark matter cells that are quite fast in that regard. I don't know if there's anything on that. So right now the main limitation is actually the the time it takes light to travel through the crystal. But and more than the electronics. More than the electronics, yes. So you have a rough number of how much it's from around 100 picoseconds. Okay. So everybody's using lantern bromide. No one else is trying to do to, to use something that's faster well, uh, if, they, if it sees. Mm, no, well, the, one of the problems of the lantern bromides is that they have natural uh, activity, radioactivity. So people are trying to come with other scintillators that are not radioactive and especially yeah. they are cheaper. So yes, there are developments being done in new detectors, scintillators, but they, they cannot be faster because, I mean, you can make them faster, but you cannot make light faster. Maybe they can lower the refraction index and that could make them a bit uh, faster, how the light actually travels inside the crystal. That will be an improvement. So, yeah. But you can have, for example, if you have much more yield, you could collimate this, for example. Is that uh, um, yeah, yes, that's, that's true. Actually, one of the things that we do is, well, in this representation, this probably will be a cylindrical uh, scintillator. We usually not, we actually don't use uh, cylindrical crystals. They have kind of a uh, conical shape because in that conical shape, that uh, increase the, the lightness bouncing less times the, the travel time. The travel mm -hmm. path is shorter for the for the light. You can play with the shape of the crystal to to minimize that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think you could partially improve the time resolution if you uh, make a position determination or uh, yes, put to detect on both sides. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. For PET, for example, for the positron emission tomography, they are trying to do that. Uh, yes, that is correct. It's, and well, now we are developing other photomultipliers that are not tubes, that they are a silicon and they are really small and they are very thin. So you can actually place several of them around the, around the crystal. So yeah, that's, that's something that we are developing. Okay, so if there's no more questions, uh, well, let's thank Bruno once again, and I think it was a fantastic talk. So thank you. Hopefully, see you soon. Thank you for having me. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bruno. Ciao.